of previous session. On day one, Colonel Sanjay Srivastava, a veteran chairperson, Climate Resilient Observing Systems Promotion Council, New Delhi, and Ms. Nisha Tandon, Vice President, NG, dealing with water resource management, were invited during the session. Both the experts discussed about problems emerging due to, due to climate change and management practices to deal with the same. They also throw light on urban development, water resource management, and climate change and governance. On day two, Mr. Mahesh Kamle, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, and Mr. Anup Notial, founder of SDC Foundation, Dehradun, were invited to a technical session. The expert discussed about sustainable livelihood, role of values and attitude in participation, principles of participatory approach, glaciers, infrastructural developments, urbanizations in hills, and migration-related issues. Now I call upon Priya ma'am again over to you to further proceed the session. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I would now like to request uh, Shipra ma'am from NIDM to kindly deliver the uh, welcome note, please. Uh, very good, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, my name is shown uh, incorrect here uh, because I'm not able to change that. So sorry for that. Uh, very good morning to all. And I welcome you all to this uh, uh, three days online training program on community-based climate change adaptation, jointly organized by National Institute of Disaster Management and Avantika University Ujjain. I firstly would like to uh, welcome the patron of this uh, uh, training program, Shri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM, MHA, and uh, Dr. Nitin M. Rane, Vice Chancellor, Avantika University, Ujjain. I also uh, welcome the program directors, Professor Santosh Kumar, Head, Governance and Inclusive Disaster Risk Reduction, and, uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Priya Rao, Dean, External uh, Relations, Avantika University, Ujjain. Welcome, ma'am. Moving forward, I also welcome the, uh, the uh, eminent speakers we have for today. Uh, firstly, the, for this technical session, uh, Ms. Uh, Niti Mishra from uh, Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, Shukra. And for the next technical uh, session, I also welcome the advocate Pamarthi uh, Venkateshwar, uh, sorry, sorry for that, Pamarthi uh, Venkat Ramana, international jurist, author, columnist, advocate, Supreme Court of India. Welcome, sir. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Shipra. Dear friends, it gives me uh, immense uh, pleasure to welcome Neeti ma'am as well as Pamarti sir today. Thank you so much for joining us and agreeing to share your knowledge with our audience today. So uh, let me introduce our first speaker for today. She is Neeti Mishra, Assistant Professor with the Center for Disaster Management, Jamshedi Tata School, uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. She completed an MPhil from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai in 2017, and her core expertise is extended to the fields of disaster risk, disaster governance, risk reduction, disaster recovery, climate change, environment, and disasters. Recipient of the MSc in Disaster Management from Tata Institute in 2009, and an MSc in Environment Science from Mumbai University. Neeti has more than a decade of on and off field professional experience in streams related to disaster risk management, sustainability, and environment. She has contributed her expertise and services while working with government agencies on disaster management and risk reduction. She has also actively engaged in various capacities with the corporate organizations on EHS, a consultant organization for CSR NGO management, and CSOs for environmental education. Since 2013, she has held the role of proficient management in academic programs and teaching with the Jamshedji Tata School of Disaster Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Dear friends, today she'll be addressing us on climate change adaptation and transformative mechanism. Over to you, Neeti ma'am. Thank you once again. Uh, 
Uh, you're on mute, ma'am. Sorry, I said thank you, Vandika, ma'am, and uh, welcome everyone to the uh, to the training program organized by NIDM. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if uh, if it's visible. Just one second. Just one second. There's some problem. Request all the other participants to kindly mute their microphones, please. Is my screen visible? Avantika ma'am, is my screen visible? No, no ma'am. It shows uh, you have started screen sharing, but it's not visible. Okay. Is it visible now? There seem to be some issue. The screen is not visible. Is it visible now? No ma'am. Because I've already started screen sharing, I don't know why it's... Okay, let me try again. Is it visible now? No, ma'am. Unfortunately, it's not. I'm, I'm not sure what is the issue. Uh, can I send you the PPT? Yes, will, will that be okay? Yes, yes. Ma'am, have you received the email? Hello? Hello? Yes, ma'am. Just give me a minute. Sure. sure. Yeah, I think it's visible now. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so uh, uh, I apologize for some for the technical glitches. Uh, I'm not sure why the screen share was not possible. So uh, my lecture for today is, uh, or the talk uh, is going to be about uh, talking about climate change adaptation and what the idea of transformative or transformational uh, adaptation means for the field of climate change. And I'm going to end it with uh, talking about what uh, what does it mean for community-based adaptations. So uh, next slide, please. The entire slide is not visible. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when we talk about the idea of transformation, uh, everyone knows that transformation is talking about change. But when we are talking about transformation, 
here we speak about an incremental level of change more related with human activity in change introduced due to human activity is very much anthropocentric and uh, therefore this change is gradual and it completely changed the context where we are talking about transformation so for example when we are talking about societies which moved from urban way or rural way of living to urban ways when cities were developed that completely changed the socio political economic cultural way of human activity human living so that sort of change we are talking about and that is where the idea of transformation comes from that the change is incremental and it completely alters the context where the change is happening next slide uh in that context when we look at uh, human activities impacting climate change we have seen a, a planetary changes happening since 20th century which uh, for example there is rise in global temperature there is uh, changes has been seen in the ozone hole and uh, that is where we started understanding the whole idea of uh, the whole paradigm of environment change so we do we do understand that human have the capacity to bring in change at the planetary level but when it comes to the impact that this change has brought in that is something which we are still grappling with or we are unable to uh, manage these changes and that's where we start talking about uh, we become cognizant of climate change and the impacts of climate change and climate change risk uh, which is uh, happening at the planetary level uh, next slide when we're talking about uh, uh, the reasons i'm talking about uh, the uh, the difference between coping and adaptation is when i'm talking about transformative adaptation we need to understand that transformative is long term change is change which uh, uh, which will alter the context altogether so when we are talking about coping uh, coping is sort of reversible change uh, when you say coping coping is short term it brings in reversible change in behavior that means you can go back uh the steps that you have taken you can go back to the original position where you started but when we talk about transformative adaptation it is it talks about adaptation is about irreversible change so when we are saying coping with climate change you will take small measures reactive actions but when we are talking about adaptation the practice has to be long term behavioral change so the practice of coping and uh adaptation they do work parallelly but uh, when it is serving communities when we are looking at community angle the context the interest becomes very much different one is a uh, very small term goal a uh, very small term crisis oriented adaptation is talking about your adaptive capacity it is talking about your um, uh, about uh, changing your capacity to uh, to the environment for long term uh, next slide please similarly when we are talking about mitigation and adaptation uh, ma'am the slides are not coming properly can you do f5 and do a full screen are they visible now ma'am yeah okay i'll i'll manage i'll manage it's okay yeah similarly when we are talking about adaptation the changes between uh, when we are trying to understand a transformation or transformation adaptation there is a difference between mitigation and adaptation and this difference has been clearly uh, established by unfcc uh, more with the idea that uh, to formulate your uh, international policies so mitigation is more uh, is is more like a subset of adaptation it, it talks about uh, it, it talks about looking at the uh, uh changing in lifestyles technologies that will address the idea of uh, that would address the greenhouse gas emissions while adaptation talks about reversing the root cause itself of climate change risk and vulnerability so that is the basic difference therefore when we are talking about uh, climate change we are uh, we, these two that these two actions the mitigation action and adaptation actions are different so one is one is more long term and one starts more on what is the current what is the current focus and how we 
uh, how we are looking at uh, one is talking more of GHC, uh, more in terms of emission levels, and one is talking more in terms of in uh, enhancing your adaptive capacity itself and and reducing vulnerability. The next slide. Next slide. Uh, these are uh, the slide sort of gives you an idea of what is what is the main difference and the commonality between the picture tells you what is the difference and commonality between mitigation and adaptation and uh, adapt uh, one of the uh, uh, one uh, one thing which is clear about mitigation is that it is uh, fairly simple to understand the targets are easy to uh, set and achieve but uh, since adaptation is very uh, very large it spans from lo global to local level uh, the targets are very are difficult to uh, set they are difficult to achieve so people and agencies have different expressions of what these what climate change is and what climate change will contribute and often people who have to make adjustment are the ones who have not contributed to climate change so therefore adaptation becomes uh, much more important when we are talking about uh, climate change adapt uh, adaptation and uh, climate change risk and adaptation it will uh, means that there is every uh, everyday activities and structures of policy making uh, which are cognizant of climate change and climate change risk uh, are part of your adaptive so it talks in terms of your everyday uh, work everyday life as well as in policy making, what are these structures? What are the changes which will impact your community and even at uh, at the uh, individual level? Uh, next slide, please. So the question then arises: Why do we need transformative adaptation? Because if you look at any existing practice or uh, the or the idea of transformative adaptation, it talks about altering the entire ecological and social system with the aim to reduce vulnerability to climate change with the aim to address the risk of climate change it uh, it talks not only about climate change risk but it is also uh, talking about sustainable development it is also talking about resilience so the whole idea uh, it draws in from uh, the three parameters uh, from drr from uh, sustainable development goals to and link it to uh, climate change uh, addressing the vulnerabilities of climate change so therefore, the roles over here are not only addressing climate change risk, but also issues of social justice and root cause of uh, risk. And majority of your uh, uh, adaptations start from incremental and uh, incremental ideas and go up to the transformative ideas of adaptation. Next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, uh, climate change adaptation, we look at three pathways of uh, uh, adaptation. One is maintaining the status quo, that is your business as usual. You continue with the same emission, uh, with the way of development pathway, the way of emission. Then you talk about transition, which is the incremental change, and then the transformative. Uh, incremental adaptation is very much similar to your coping, mechan uh, coping mechanisms or your uh, mitigation measures where we are taking small changes into existing practices such that uh, your you uh, su uh, such that you can bring in some changes which will address uh, climate change uh, which will address the system which is under stress because of climate change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but when we're talking about transformation uh, uh, or, uh, or the transformation, climate change is reflection of. Uh, 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 how you will bring in change in an irreversible manner. So if transition or incremental change is talking about development goals and how these development goals are framed and how, uh, how it achieves certain things, climate change adaptation recognizes the risks with what these development goals are and what how we can go about bringing irreversible change. So it rec uh, recognizes, uh, it assesses the risk and goes about bringing in change. And therefore, the there's a paradigm shift away, which uh, which also uh, talks about bringing in deep social reforms. And therefore, it's talking about social equity. It is the equitable uh, uh, equitable uh, risk. Uh, it is talking about uh, your uh, addressing root causes of uh, climate change vulnerability. Uh, next slide, please. 
transformation as i said it is to, it talks about addressing problems of un, of sustainability of equal uh, of equality and it uh, tries to look at the issues of the uh, of disaster risk reduction sustainable development goals and uh, climate change risk together it uses bottom up approaches where the uh, communities are able to self organize and if you uh, rem- uh, if you uh, remember what mahesh mahesh professor mahesh amli has spoken about in yesterday uh, in yesterday's class he is talking about livelihoods and how people are impacted due to climate change risk and the the participatory approaches where people are uh, the actions are people centered so adaptation talks about communities ability to self organize and take people centered option, uh, options uh, there's uh, it talks uh, it focuses on grassroots initiatives and what are the emerging initiatives to uh, to address issues of risk and sust- and the problems of sustainability therefore it is very much uh, part of uh, developing local partnership uh, looking at local participation through fostering long term social solidarity in terms of networks in terms of research collaborations uh, adaptation is uh, there's an overlap between resilience and uh, of what uh, and what unmet needs or uh, unmet vulnerabilities which have been so far uh, left with uh, in dr practices or in sdgs climate change adaptation or the transformative adaptation could be one way of also meeting these unmet vulnerabilities next slide please why we need to talk about climate change is because we so far we have already only been doing or talking about incremental adaptation strategies which talk about coping uh, strategies which are as i said and coping are short term crisis oriented reactive measures which are not sufficient to uh, for communities who are facing future risk from climate change so uh, we know in the debates of climate change there's a lot of talk about what is the probability of risk in the future so we we need to uh, consider that and that incremental adaptation is something which which lacks uh it cannot prepare the system enough it cannot uh, alter the uh, behaviors of individual and community to deal with the changes in climate change so therefore adaptation is has to be transformative which can look at fulfilling the the global paris agreement of 1.5 min or of uh, below 1.5 uh, temperature and uh, addressing the cascading effects of climate change so therefore this attention scholarly attention has come to climate change adaptation in recent times and where we are talking about root causes of uh, climate change risk and uh, what are the vulnerabilities related to that next slide please this is what your uh, your transformative adaptation generally looks like it, it uh, takes into consideration the vulnerability the existing vulnerability uh what is the uh, probability of uh, what is the exposure and the probable sensitivity towards climate change risk what is the resilience existing resilience capacities of people resilience in terms of uh, your your capacity to cope as well as recover from any extreme weather events and uh, adaptation talks about uh, taking vulnerability and resilience together to uh, to reduce the any future uh, any future hazard which comes which results in loss and uh, the risk of loss to address the vulnerabilities and build resilience uh, in long term so that is what your climate change uh, tra- uh, adaptation or, or transformative adaptation takes into cognizance and works and works towards uh, next slide please what does it mean for community mm-hmm. since we've been talking about we've understood that there is coping there is mitigation but we need to move a step ahead and talk about transformation so what does transformation and we've already understood that transformation is about uh, is about community action and community networks and solidarities working together so what does this mean for community is that there's a shift towards more equitable and resilient development uh attention to new type of capacity building so we don't only go with the part, we uh, we are enhancing the way participatory approaches work 
So one of the uh, key uh, discussions which come up over here is knowledge co-creation, where uh, knowledge co-creation is the knowledge which is coming from the community, in from action research, from participatory labs, from learning labs, and uh, and that knowledge becomes part of your policy advocacy and the uh, and the larger structural change. So what is the knowledge? How do people, uh, how, for example, how uh, there's research going on, how communities deal with uh, heat stresses, especially in regions which are facing, uh, which have faced uh, extreme temperatures for long, for longer duration, or have been globally uh, facing a lot of extreme weather conditions. So there's a lot of, uh, there's research going on community practices, community solutions, indigenous solutions on, uh, on communities impacted by heat wave. So what what uh, daily routine measures they take in terms of their food, in terms of water availability, in terms of clothing, in terms of housing. So and these could be part of uh, uh, climate resilient housing could be part of your larger structural policy making in, uh, when it becomes part of your affordable housing technologies. And we do see uh, some uh, we do see government of India also having policy. Uh, 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 of working towards this. So where does this come from? This comes from looking at indigenous, uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous technology, and experts coming together to understand, to bring, uh, to understand indigenous knowledge and bring technological innovations to make certain changes. So this is what your, what it means for community, uh, and it means for developing resilience and equitable. Uh, uh, equitable development where you are not only increasing uh, by bringing in policy and structural changes, you're not only addressing uh, the resilience, increasing the resilience of the people, but you're also ensuring that there is equitable way of addressing climate changes. Uh, next slide, please. One, uh, one mechanism or one way or tool which is available to address this idea of uh, community adaptation and, plan and transformative Adaptation is through the uh, is through the concept of ecosystem based adaptation. Uh, we know about ecosystem based approaches. Ecosystem based approach will talk about management of land, water, all resources that humans be, need to survive. How do you promote? How do you conserve them in a sustainable and equitable manner? And this idea of sustaining, conserving uh, ecosystems in sustainable manner has been adapted uh, in climate change adaptation processes and it's called uh, ecosystem based adaptation when it where it's looking at ecosystems and biodiversity which helps people to adapt in the long term the typical examples are where you have communities which are managing forest which are managing wetlands as uh, uh, as they are as protecting their food security or you have uh, uh, coastal systems uh, where mangroves, uh, salt marshes, sand dunes are part of your protective barriers towards storm surges or any extreme weather related events. So these are your typical examples of the uh, ecosystems approach, which are now being recognized as ecosystem adaptation approaches also. Uh, ecosystem based mitigation is also a concept which talks about how ecosystems and biodiversities are leading towards reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions more in terms of understanding how carbon sinks work and uh, if we talk about uh, ecosystem uh, mitigation then we can look at uh, your uh, uh, we can look at uh, forest protections and how forest and ocean protections become part of your mechanisms to protect uh, uh, which act as carbon sinks and pro uh, protect the natural systems from uh, 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 from further degradation. Next slide, please. This is the whole idea behind your uh, uh, behind ecosystem based adaptation. It talks about reducing vulnerability and enhancing resilience. It draws in from the UNFCC climate change adaptation, uh, the Paris Agreement. It draws from the Sendai framework of disaster risk reduction and the sustainable development goals where it is uh, talking about uh, social long term social benefit uh, uh, long term social benefit analysis community based adaptation projects integrated co conservation 
resource management projects and community based natural resource management projects drawing from all three arenas from climate change adaptation from disaster risk reduction and sustainable development goals the uh, ecosystem based adaptation uh, talks about community and community based adaptation projects uh, their natural resource based projects to reduce vulnerability and enhance the resilience in long term uh, next slide please so what this uh, what uh, as i was saying it it is about achieving your sdgs it is about achieving your paris goals set in paris agreements through nature based solutions uh, such as uh, adapt as i've mentioned before adaptation projects community based adaptation projects or community based city uh, uh, projects so there it, it is a systematic link between drr cca and your sdgs where community is the critical agent of change your local actors not only community but your local institutions uh lo local institution play a uh, play the main role in bringing in these changes where community participation is essential in planning and managing drr and cca and your community based resource management form gives important lessons for how uh, ecosystem based approaches and community system, uh, ecosystem based adaptation and uh commu uh, community based adaptation projects can work together uh with this i come and into my presentation uh, any questions uh, any questions any doubts we can keep the floor open for or uh, uh, ma'am do we take the questions now or after each of the sessions uh, we can take it now as we are in the session i guess there was a question in the chat box so first and foremost thank you so much ma'am for your insight local knowledge on uh, on climate change and adaptation so uh uh meenal uh, yeah uh, so meenal one of uh, uh, what is happening on field right now is a we are uh, there is research which is going on on indigenous knowledge that is how we bring local knowledge to the mainstream by looking at practices uh, understanding uh, understanding these practices and writing about it publishing about it so research is one thing the other is action research action research is uh, where you uh, where the research is co completely people centric driven by uh, driven by the local people and they decide what is the problem and what is the solution that they are, that they can work in so uh, in my slides i have mentioned knowledge labs or uh, learning labs and knowledge co creation so that is one way of going about uh, your uh, introducing local knowledge on climate change and adaptation strategies to the higher level and uh, a lot of work is happening if you if you go on uh, if you try to search material on uh, knowledge co creations and on uh, action research for climate change you will get a lot of community based ideas where your indigenous knowledge systems are being understood recognized and taken up to the to bring in changes at policy level Thank you, ma'am. Are there friends? Any other questions, please? Thank you so much, Niti, ma'am, for the wonderful session. Thank you. And, uh, dear friends, we'll be proceeding with the next session for today. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our next speaker for today. Sri Pamarthi Venkatramana is an eminent jurist and policy specialist. He's a life member of Supreme Court of India Bar, and he's noted for saving. national wealth in several key matters thank you so much for joining us pamarty sir dear friends some important cases dealt by pamarty sir include saving national wealth the fabled nizam jewelry from going out of india through relentless court battles in the mbt arjun prototype scam got then foremost tanks expert and another key head in the defense department reinstated when both were served compulsory retirement orders for being honest got a foreign national declared as a persona non grata after conducting a court trial for her espionage activities amicus curiae supreme court of india to defend survivors of encounters while they were serving sentences defended the honor of a deceased pm in a defamation statement made by an ex coas who had served under the late pm pro bono legal services to soldiers teachers peasants senior citizens and the public in general pil to save countless lives of students who were indulging in act of self immolation in the mandal agitations he is the custodian 
FDI funds for Make in India projects. Dear friends, I'm also happy to bring to your notice some of the awards uh, won by Pamarty Sir. is the best young lawyer award in first year of practice by Justice Alladi Kupuswami Memorial Trust. Lifetime Achievement Award for Medicine and Law by Edward Kennedy Memorial. Foundation USA Award given at Kuala Lumpur by Ambassador Shri Kirumurthy. American Biographical Institute World Young Leadership Award. He has more feathers in his cap, dear friends. He is also a noted columnist and a published author. Some of his publications include books on spiritual poetry, such as In a Blink, Chasing a Shadow, a master's piece, book of short stories, namely The Whispering Star, and his forthcoming book, Vishwaguru. We are indeed blessed to have you as our resource person, sir. Thank you so much. Friends, today he shall be addressing us on climate change law and policy. Over to you, Pamati, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, friends, it's a privilege to address this gathering of people who are actually concerned about the most sensitive aspect of good governance, namely uh, disaster management, disaster reduction, and how to encounter a counter any uh, damages which might be caused by vagaries of nature. Before proceeding further, I think I'm voicing the sentiments of all those participants here in expressing our deep appreciation of the inputs over the last three days, meticulously conducted under Dr. Priya and her team and the NIDM. It's also a privilege to applaud the human services being rendered by the NIDM under Dr. Preeti Skuni, Dr. Hassan, and of course, under the able uh, uh, ministership of Sri Amit Shahji, where we are all looking towards having a new India carved for the betterment of the quality of life of each and every citizen of our country. Having said this, I think it is important for us today to discuss uh, about climate change, uh, both the legal aspects as well as the policies required to ensure that the laws are fitting into all the actions and efforts being put in by different people across the fields and layers of our society, with particular reference to our own country. Friends, you know, policymakers and lawmakers cannot be cheerleaders. You cannot toe the line of others and try to become cogs in the wheel, like so-called NGOs and social uh, workers and social leaders who uh, seek human, uh, financial resources most of the time in order to carry out the good work required by society. All said and done, climate policy has become central in the fight for global power. Climate policy has become critical for geo uh, geopolitical jockeying also. <clears throat> we also know that climate change has been a uh, most uh, a thorny issue for policymakers as well as uh, stakeholders in good governance systems. A fifth of the food output growth has been lost due to climate change, they say. However, friends, please understand that we should examine from all aspects of the matter. There is a theory, there is a study, a scientific study, in fact, which says Earth's climate has been thoroughly mapped out by paleontology studies, as most of us know. It is not warming. It has been colder in the last 1,000 years than the previous 9,000 years. The warm Holocene will come to an end and return us to a world of ice. We're not ready because of a fake human climate emergency. That's another thought. Having said all this, please understand, friends, before we address this problem, let us also understand where do we stand? Who are we? What are we? Uh, let us examine human beings, nature, and energy in their own uh, relationship and coexistence, generation after generation. We humans have regarded Earth not just as a town, but as a place for you to despoil and to destroy. We are too engrossed with the immediate, too absorbed with the individual problems to look at basic issues. Today, today's problem has taken centuries to grow into its uh, present threatening proportions. We are searching for new and renewable resources because the fuels on which we have grown dependent are fast and recklessly depleted in the hands of few who control them. What we have to understand is not work in the long term unless there is a change in our thinking, in our mind, unless we are not as masters of the universe, but as tiny components of an exceedingly complex system in which the smallest part 
has a specific role. The law of cosmos, the microcosm is less important than macrocosm. This is something which we should all remember. I never cease to be awestruck by the wonder of the balance in nature, where waste itself has its uses in the renewal of life. Man, in his greed and belief in his own power, has ignored natural laws. We have disturbed and continue to disturb this marvelous equilibrium, yet we are astonished at the dangers that confront us, which we ourselves have created. We must view energy in its entirety for problems of survival and progress. And these are not pieces to be put together. They are all inseparable parts of an integrated whole. The reality of the energy crisis hangs perilously over us, not only in India, not only in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but also in the so-called developed regions of Europe and the United States of America. We have an awesome task. The mutual interest of the diverse groups and the nations lies in more than merely preventing a military holocaust and nations lies in more than merely preventing a military holocaust, which by its very nature is unlikely to leave any victor. Having said this, the present pattern of exploitation of the world's resources and the resultant search for and attempt to dominate the world energy resources can only create friction. Monopoly of the energy potential by the affluent is not only dep depriving the poor and but also leading to instability and insecurity. Similarly, within nations, the serious imbalance in energy supply aggravates social evils, especially those associated with unplanned urbanization. In contemporary in India, as in some other parts of the world, energy resources range from such primary and uncomplicated forms as manual labor and animal power to the most advanced use of nuclear and social solar energy technology. Impressive quantities of commercial energy are regulated uh, they are regularly produced from coal, lignite, oil, and the hydroelectric potential of waterways. At the same time, there is also extensive use of familiar non-commercial sources such as firewood, agricultural waste, and animal dung. Our planning is enriched, enriched, but also complicated by the contrast between urban India with its organized activity and the decentralized rural sector. These parallel streams are sources of strength, although rising expectations have led to some social streams aggravated by the ever-increasing cost of energy. Your realistic understanding of our complex social and economic conditions and our broader vision of the world community have enabled us to shield our development from the consequences of rapid and undiminished, undimensional industrialization. We emphasize our commitment modestly, though firmly, to the rational use of energy and natural resources with the ultimate object of, uh, objective of preserving our environment. Having, having said this, it's also important for us to try to give, uh, uh, give food for thought. Uh, uh, we, why should we not go back to coal, which we have enormous uh, quantities of in our country, and make that as a better source? Yeah, in spite of and regardless of other studies, which try to belittle the utilization of coal as a source of energy. There is little possibility of any fundamental change in the existing structure of the energy program However, another experiment, inexpensive and of almost immediate utility, is the generation of biogas from city and town sewage. The extra amount of power required is small, but it increases the output of power by 70%. Its financial returns are encouraging, apart from its great advantage of preventing river pollution. If the laws of nature are thwarted, renewable sources will also be exhausted. The indiscriminate felling of trees had denuded of forests creating disastrous ecological imbalances that affect the very quality of life. In its sternest form, nature exacts retribution for the treeless scars on its mountain sides, landslides, devastating floods, and the silting up of reservoirs and rivers are the result. Rainfall begins to dwindle, and the desert resumes its deadly march. Friends, none of us can, none of us can predict an earthquake. We all know that. Floods, of course, we have been able to control, monitor using, uh, with utilization of satellite technology, mapping, and other preventive measures. Please understand that what is required today is not just a rhetorical repetition of whatever has been incorporated in manuals of study for disaster management or disaster reduction. Climate policy, as we all know, as I have said earlier, it has become critical for geopolitical jockeying. All the various conferences conducted, whether in Montreal or in uh, Egypt, Paris, or any other part of the world, or even in India, now that we are uh, taking, we have taken over the leadership of the G20, 
it is also our onerous responsibility to ensure that natural disaster reduction and management uh, is a key aspect of discussion and we work out evolve better methods i'll be coming to those suggestions in course of our discussion however before going further it is important to understand that climate is becoming an integral part of numerous economic sectors it's not just energy anymore but it is also industry farming buildings transport besides the world needs to ensure that trade plays by the green rules too so there there are recent wars between europe and the united states of america diplomatic wars where they discussing about the need to give reciprocal exemptions for non uh, 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 compliance with certain mandatory requirements required by corporate entities to report in the annual reports they have to inform as to the proper compliance and adherence to standards set to ensure that there are no violations of uh, the uh, rules pertaining to carbon credits eco credits and eco credits and so on the energy crisis and soaring prices have tightened the links between climate and economic policy transition to low carbon solutions like home grown and affordable renewables is also an important aspect as climate policy gets intertwined with industrial goals new fronts for disputes are opening and rules on exchange of goods are already uh, being hotly contested carbon emissions global over overcapacity rare earths and other resources which are critical for clean technologies are all bones of contention between large superpowers like the united states china russia and other european countries as well as our own country for example the g7 uh, the new climate club uh, for the world's most advanced countries by launching a permanent bureau intends to help coordinate rules with the aim of avoiding disputes over green tariffs it's again a club the so called poorer countries are left out where does this happen and why does this happen uh, for example let's go back to the so called cop 15 un biodiversity conference the biodiversity conference which was held in montreal where the threat of mass extinction of plant and animal species has, has led 195 nations to agree to protect and restore at least 30% of the earth's land and water by 30, 2030 we are at the fag end of 2022 and they are aiming to do this by 2030 and a new biodiversity fund of 30 billion dollars was created uh, uh, under the global environment facility which is a 30 year old 30 years old organization that supports environmental work however uh, uh, however this they say by 2030 but hardly any portion of this money has been disbursed uh, uh, to people poorer nations are still waiting for rich countries to fully meet a promise of its 100 billion dollars annually in climate financing which is supposed to start floating in the year 2020 so these are all certain uh, ground realities which we should understand on a, a global scenario the financial institutions also know understand that a, car a carnage in nature is uh, to be treated as an economic failure private sectors new financial mechanisms have been brought out by the private sector for biodiversity such as debt for nature swaps deals bio credits and natural capital funds ecology transition and a mandatory requirement for companies to be transparent that is with regulators investors and the public has also been understood to be playing a pivotal role in the matters of climate change law and policy people also realize that the biggest danger now is going to be civil suits which are going to be filed on the basis of health claim however here it is important for us to now go on to more uh, realistic ground uh, situation for example yeah for example people have been speaking uh, 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 very vociferously in favor of community community groups going out and reaching out to people uh, in villages in rural rural areas and in urban areas but what is required is a, a more broader outlook for example what has happened to our culture we must go back to our roots we should go back to our roots we had a culture where every roadside had flowering plants had flowers had fruits orchards uh, across the countryside where have we gone why have we forgotten this india should as a matter of policy start encouraging these so called 
non-governmental organizations working in the field of uh, disaster management to firstly go reach out to the people in the countryside and start planting fruits uh, uh, of different varieties on both sides of the highways, on the roadsides, and flower, flowering plants. So fruits, vegetables, and all these other uh, uh, positive uh, forms of vegetation should replace the thorny bushes which you find on the roadside, on the highways. Climate change requires firstly a forestation. And a forestation does not mean merely planting trees, not just any tree. There is a lot of study undertaken, and people must understand that which are the trees which actually do not sap the water from the uh, soil and which are the ones who actually lend uh, give more oxygen out in the air and which are more useful and which are more meaningful. In this direction, we should also look towards Japan, which has used the rubber wall technology across the coastline. As you know, tsunamis are a most common feature and phenomena in uh, Japan. India also has been facing and any part of the world is susceptible and can be hit by the ravages of a tsunami, uh, of, uh, which is follow, uh, which is preceded by an earthquake. Earthquake is followed by a tsunami oftentimes when the magnitude is high. It's common knowledge now, thanks to social media and other uh, dissemination of information. So what should we do? Japan uses a rubber wall technology. Why not us? And how does one do this? We also build a fiber wall after the uh, uh, after the first rubber wall. Uh, technology is utilized. It does not mean a rubber wall is used. You use the right type of plants, plant them across the coastline. It acts uh, as the first form of defense. You have dikes in the Netherlands and other ancient systems. Likewise, he, we had buns in India. Somebody was discussing the other day about the traditional methods of uh, addressing uh, natural disasters and preempting them. So likewise, preempting lightnings. Likewise, uh, lightning strikes and uh, a colossal damage caused by that to life of human beings as well as cattle. So what we should do is we should try to utilize our advanced technologies, which we do have in our country, for example, the laser beam to halt natural disasters. Water is dried in a fraction of a minute. I do not know how many of us have heard about this, but a laser beam can dry rivers, ponds, and even sea in a fraction of a minute. So one should utilize uh, this technology, which is available in most uh, susceptible and vulnerable parts of the coastal belt. And then you have the laser beam to halt natural disasters. The water is dried in the fraction of a minute, whether it is rivers, ponds, sea, that is the capacity and capability of this. Instead of trying to utilize this to uh, amass land or aggrandize power, one can utilize this in a very positive manner to counter the vagaries of nature. And when we speak of climate change, as I said, foremost is afforestation. Only then can we give technology a push. Hydrogen, carbon dioxide, all these other studies, particular types of plants, and not just, a, not just any type of tree uh, uh, is right for the purpose. These are all certain important vital points which we have to bear in mind. Green revolution does not just mean planting just about anything which is green, not cactus, not uh, crotons, not tawny bushes fruits, vegetables, which produce oxygen, and waters and not uh, plants which sap, uh, the, uh, not plants which sap the water. And so natural calamities can be averted in this manner. So there is a urgent need and a necessity for knitting the cultural ethos written back to the original culture of the country, of the society, and balancing of power between man and nature, between flora and fauna is most important. Likewise, then we come to another important aspect of man-made uh, dangers, man-made dangers uh, which have been created uh, by, uh, let's say, gensets, towers. These uh, result in so much of radiation. It's not just, uh, we have technology where this radiation is actually reaching up to Patal, literally speaking to the bottom of the earth's crust, the surface, the bottom, and uh, to the end, uh, to the, bottommost region of the recesses of earth. So these are all very dangerous, not just a surface. Density was the same earlier too, but fruits and vegetables were more then. And please understand, take it for granted, certain studies conducted by our own research group have given reliable predictions that 50% of the population will get immediate relief 
relief if at all this country started planting more and more fruits and vegetables across the countryside throughout. Even the poor man can have uh, food free of cost on the highway. Uh, a person who cannot afford two square meals a day or even the others who are passing by can just get on and pluck fruits, uh, vegetables and enjoy as it used to happen in this country once, uh, once upon a time, despite the words of the naysayers. And then we come to more something more closer to society. As someone was saying yesterday, uh, I think the organizer, all these things are such that they will come and reach your doorstep in case you neglect to attend and address these uh, so-called broader, larger, far away problems like natural disasters, which one often times in urban areas reads only in the newspapers or watches and telecasts. Please understand heart attacks. These are mainly caused because of radiation. The fickle mindedness of people, you notice that people tend to become moody. These are not hormonal changes. These are not, these are not purely environmental changes created by radiation, which has been created with a lot of uh, overutilization of technology, gadgets, and uh, as I said, the, uh, the towers. So here we come to technology on a higher level, in a different dimension. We're speaking of telecom. 35,000 feet is the level at which our, our telecom network works at the moment. Satellite link and uh, the other things are complicated matters which need not be addressed to this particular gathering. Networking and uh, most important is we do not have our own IP. India does not have its own IP. In the process, what happens is the lot, everything is vulnerable, everything is susceptible. susceptible. You hear of uh, uh, premier hospitals uh, being hacked, the systems being hacked, different systems being hacked, ministries being hacked. What is the reason? It's all because we do not have our own IP. Something has been compromised somewhere. A lot of disinformation has been spread across the country. The bureaucrats are not aware. The politicians are least aware. People do not have time. So it is for people like us, scientists, students, or the next generation of people who are political scientists and social scientists to address this, come to the root of the problem and see that we remove the towers, we have wireless receivers, and we become hack proof. So because now it is computing chips, chips uh, in computing chips, motherboard and processors are the key elements. We do not uh, actually utilize these systems in a positive manner. We do not know about a rubber wall. We do not know about a fiber wall. We do not recommend these to the government or the powers that be that these should be utilized. Instead, we speak of uh, funding small little NGOs or anonymous bodies and asking them to go out and do community service which actually illiterate people can do, not people who are literate like you, who are specialized, who are focused on a very, very vulnerable and most important area. For example, India is strong in software. And telecom, as I said, should be a most important portion of uh, utilization for natural disaster uh, reduction as well as risk management. It, be it in defense, be it in railways, be it in postal, be it in central secretariat, be it in parliament, be it in universities, educational institutions, healthcare institutions. India should ensure that the panel control and the country's master server remains with the country. And these are things which only the Ministry of Home Affairs, where the NIDM is doing a pioneering service, should attend to address and ensure that there is a separate think tank uh, body formed drawing even people from the different services who alone are aware about national security. Please understand, national security is as much linked with uh, disaster reduction management as disaster management is with national security and sovereignty of the country. That is the reason we, in our wisdom, have got this particular department under the control of Ministry of Home Affairs. Not many people are aware. They think it's something related to social service or they think it is something relating to urban development or rural development, which is not the case. See, like Japan uses a rubber wall technology, I keep harping and repeating it often only because we should understand the importance and the need to utilize this for our own country. Having said this, we should also understand that developing countries use a mere fraction of the total energy consumed by industrialized countries. As the standards of living rise, they will demand much more conventional energy, contributing to the already serious depletion. And more energy will be required, not just for industrialization and urbanization, but also for agriculture. A large part of India's petroleum imports are converted into fertilizers, and a quarter of all our electricity goes into agricultural operations. 
If developing nations do not get the energy they need and deserve, how can they fight poverty? At the same time, the financial constraints deny them the investment necessary to harness energy through known technologies. Therefore, the search for new technologies that requires less capital has to be our endeavor, and the concept of sustaining labor for capital is also a familiar one. All this scramble for preemption of the world's fossil fuel deposits and the accumulation of increasingly sophisticated and energy intensive weapon systems, which is leading to the arms race and the policies of confrontation are before us to be seen. We should also understand that it is very important that mutual recrimination and confrontation does not help. What we should also understand is that one should devise newer methods new methods of trying to uh, finance all the efforts for uh, climate change. So it is not necessary, it is not only uh, sufficient, if at all you stick to the conventional methods or textbook methods or the ones which manuals speak of uh, for climate change. Climate change requires a lot of innovative measures, your heating bill, uh, everybody speaks only of a Paris, field, a Paris deal for biodiversity or the Montreal deal. So this is not the way it has to be done. What are the gains we have made? Has to be a continuous, uh, there should be an audit. Uh, a suggestion has also been made to the government of India, the present government to ensure that there is a climate audit or an environmental audit, which must be made as a compulsory paragraph in the annual report to be uh, submitted by, by corporate entities uh, at the end of each and every year of business operations. CSR does not necessarily mean uh, funding bodies which are registered and was, which are seeking to do and bring about social service activities or post uh, disaster management uh, functions and role. So once the cyclone hits, there's no point in just trying to remove the carcasses that even we have other uh, social organizations like the uh, Ramakrishna Mission and many other uh, uh, bodies of the uh, country which have been doing uh, rendering social service to help people in distress in times of natural disaster. It is not required. What is required is that we should understand that energy problem is only one portion of the so-called problem of climate change. Secondly, we should also understand that that it is a, a, a misnomer, it is a wrong, uh, faulty thinking to assume that this so-called climate change crisis has only started with uh, a small little tiny puny ambassadors of the United Nations being branded about around the world as being ambassadors of climate change. No, this has been going on since long, thousands and millions of years. It's been an ongoing process, merely because there is a phobia or a fear psychosis which has been created due to bad practices uneven governance systems, poor governance systems, or lack of attention being paid by people in governance, people who are making the policies, it does not mean that this is something new or this is something which cannot be addressed. It has always been addressed. The panic has been created. The uh, uneven distribution of resources is what has caused a lot of conflict in political circles, in social circles, and economies have been deprived and depraved so therefore, it is important for us to get rid to be rid ourselves of the feeling of inferiority. India is nowhere below any other country, nowhere lesser than any other country in this field. We shall address this, and it is to be a constant effort, a continuous effort. The thinking of my point is this: the sum and substance of this entire discussion is climate change law and policy requires a different mindset. Do not attend to any of these classes any of these sessions or any of these modules of these subjects or the training programs as students, but start thinking, inculcate your own thinking, thought process, and give suggestions as to how the government can better address, how universities through their own departments can better address, and both at the micro and macro level, and see that uh, newer laws, better rules can be brought in to regulate the control of disasters, prevent uh, major uh, damage, and ensure safety of life, property. So therefore, uh, if the existing laws are tweaked in a thousand different small little ways, the entire world will be totally different, it will be totally new, and the role of each and every worker, or each and every person related to cl uh, climate change or even disaster management will turn into that of a scientist, that of a thinker, and that of 
one who is definitely a son of the soil and a person who is a proud member of this planet. This is important and I feel uh, having said this, I think it is my uh, also duty, uh, it is also my duty to thank both Dr. Preeti Sonia of NADM, Dr. Hassan of NADM and Dr. Priya of Avantika University for giving me this opportunity to interact with you and to share uh, a few thoughts on this most important subject. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pamarthi, sir, for the wonderful session. Uh, dear friends, the forum is open for discussion now. You may please ask any questions that you have in mind. Anyone, any questions, please? Yes, uh, Pamarthi, sir, I have a question. So uh, when we talk about policy, uh, you know, in, in India, unfortunately, we have a habit of blaming everything on the government, which should not be done so. So uh, what I really feel is, sir, uh, maybe, you know, we have the disaster risk reduction and, uh, uh, you know, studies which are being carried out in the higher educational institutions. And it is, again, an initiative of NIDM as well to include it in the curriculum. But uh, is it advisable or is the government taking any steps in this regard to introduce it maybe at an earlier stage, maybe in the schools, because the kids will be at the impressionable age there? Yes, you're right. This uh, has to be introduced at the stage of civics, which is a subject which is introduced probably in class three or class five of the CBC. The Kendri Vidyalas are doing it, uh, and all the other schools shall be following suit. And I'm sure. The purpose of NIDM having and the network of, of uh, headed by Dr. Sony and others. Uh, the purpose is to ensure people who have a certain ability to understand what is right and what is wrong and to form uh, proper cognitive ideas are the ones who are at the school and college level, undergraduate and postgraduate. Therefore, they have introduced there. But I'm totally with you, and I feel that uh, a small little paragraph or a very little a small chapter should be introduced starting right from class three or class five. Because already in class one, I have been asking them to do a small little thing. For example, you find school vans. The school students, you notice when you drive out on the road, they throw out small little wrappers from outside the window because there's no dustbin kept in the school van. So a small little change from there will help them start thinking in a positive manner and it will go in a different way. So I'm sure you're right. And they are doing it and it should be done. Well said. So, uh, any other uh, you know policies of the government which the educational institutions can uh, you know follow or uh, really contribute to? Since we have many educationists today, uh, maybe you know if you could throw some light on that, it would we would really be great. <coughs> sure, that's a very good point. I feel as in when they are renewing the recognition of all these universities, schools, and private institutions, especially the government ones, or as it is bound to do, carry out shramdan. Uh, tree plantation, sapling, and all this. But as and when these people are going in for renewal of the uh, uh, licenses and permissions, whether on an annual or any other periodical basis, they must be told, made, uh, it must be a mandatory uh, duty on part of the management, including the teachers, not necessarily the students, to source uh, at least a few thousand saplings in the neighborhood and tend to them. And they did not keep the board. They should only keep the board of the nation. We are one nation. We need one uniform telecom policy, one uniform civil court on education policy, and one ethos. Only then, because it is one planet, when a disaster strikes, it does not discriminate between man-made barriers like caste, religion, region, etc. So we should go and a one banner, one national flag, as you have in the background of your uh, frame. So that is what we should inculcate, and that is a must. And all the educationists should take it upon themselves. These associations should not be only buccaneer organizations. Sorry to say that, but it is a fact of life. But they should also go towards the social contribution for the nation, for the society, for themselves, and for future generations. Thank you. So, Good afternoon, uh, sir. Uh, Ma'am, I have a question. Can yes, I... please, ma'am. Yes, please. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, I would like to ask one thing. Like, business communities also do play a vital role uh, in adapting, you know, preserving the climate and all these things. So what is your opinion if we can sensitize them uh, to move from profit to purpose motive? How we can sensitize business communities about this? Well, that's a good point. By definition, business organizations are aimed at generating profits, money for the economy. However, uh, we have in the existing laws a certain provision 
for CSR and the corporate social responsibility, which often uh, is pegged at three times of the net profit of the last three preceding years of these organizations they allocate. However, here a point should be made that one third at least should be utilized specifically and essentially for disaster reduction management. And they should do it only through the government nodal bodies like the NIDM uh, or the NDMA and not by themselves or through any other uh, supporting NGOs. Oftentimes the NGOs are formed by the directors or relatives of the directors or relatives of bureaucrats and there the entire purpose is defeated. So this should be, uh, 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 the wheel should be lifted and this should be cleansed and you're right in trying to sensitize these people and make it mandatory upon them by law, by force of right. law, that one third at least should go towards uh, uh, disaster reduction management and through the government. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Pamati sir, I have one more question. Uh, yes, please. Since we're situated in Ujjain and uh, we feel, and it is our duty to be a part of, you know, the local uh, administration here as well, and to help the local administration uh, in reaching goals related to disaster risk reduction too. We are associated with the Ujjain uh, Municipal Corporation too here. Uh, would it be advisable, say, uh, nationwide, if educational institutions join hands uh, with the local administration? And what are your thoughts on this, uh, you know, as a policymaker and uh, advocate? See, Vijayan for one, Vijayan for one has actually, for those who understand, spiritually it's a uh, hotbed and center point for all other belief systems in our country. So, and it is a very, very uh, uh, powerful and a rich institution there. There you, are, you have a temple there. Educational institutions, again, are temples and uh, courts are temples of justice. So all the uh, higher judiciary can always instruct the uh, district judiciary that the lower ranks of hierarchy of judicial mechanism, as well as the collectors and the sub-collectors and the STMs to join hands with the schools, just as they carry out activities like the NSS, the National Social Service Scheme. Likewise, these people can join hands, create a network, and on weekends, they can all join hands. If there was a total lockdown on the entire country, it could be shut, uh, closed in for two uh, complete years doing nothing. Why can't we once in every fortnight or every weekend spend three hours jointly together in the entire neighborhood and spread out a new culture of, of, of sowing seeds, watering saplings and uh, fostering brotherhood and uh, feeling of peace, prosperity and unity. Yes, it should be done, it can be done. And unless, however, unfortunately, you and me are only thinking, unless one is seated in the position of power, one cannot seek to implement. But with the right thinking and the right people in the, at the helm of affairs, this can be done, this will be done, and we must do it with, without or against anybody else's support. One is a majority, and I'm sure the present dispensation with the Honorable Prime Minister having his own program and an agenda, uh, all educational institutions will follow, support, and go ahead with this. That's a good point. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, Advocate Pamarati. Yes, please. Yeah, this is uh, Dr. Rani, Vice Chancellor of Antika University. Hello, sir. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. Hmm. Uh, it's a really good session of you, sir. And we uh, really enjoyed a lot, like good information we got from your session. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, one question I am having, sir. Ji. Yeah. So basically, in all uh, progressive country, like uh, climate change uh, is a uh, issue of uh, concern, right? They are more serious about it. But when we are coming in uh, India, like it is close to everybody, but no one is uh, serious, particularly the uh, the administration, the government, the public and everybody, right? So already the laws are there, the acts are there. Like what is the reason? What would be the uh, remedial actions as far as you are an uh, advocate would be suggested by your side so that it can be implemented uh, strictly? Uh, well, that's wonderful, sir. Uh, to tell the truth, there has been a good beginning made, although it's a small beginning by people from NIDM and uh, even at the government level. Unfortunately, what happens is campaigns like Swachh Bharat, they all became momentary. Uh, campaigns like Tiranga, Hargar Tiranga, these are all, they, they become transitional. That's because the bureaucrats are kept in, uh, in charge. What we should do is, someone like the Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, Mr. Narendra Modi ji, 
who has got a monkey bath program, like Winston Churchill used to do long, long ago. What right. happens? He is he is able to motivate the younger generation and the other masses. People like him at all levels, the state governors or the state chief ministers, should also broadcast and inculcate this and spread the word. Likewise, your honorable self as a honorable vice chancellor of a very important university. Once we motivate, this will definitely take off. And I'm sure in the turn in by the uh, by this time next year, I'm sure you will find a dramatic change. It is possible. It can be done. And the only thing is a sense of unity or a sense of diffidence or lack of confidence in people is all being propagated by untamed, uncaged mass media or paid media people, which we should not give importance to. Like I said, climate change has got two versions. Some people are speaking of global warming. There are reports which are speaking of global icing. Right. So we all knew once upon a time that India after Bharat Kanda was off to Australia. Right. Uh, uh, when I went to Australia, I was surprised when Aborigines there were speaking a few uh, words of Tamil. So right. which you speak in Tamil now to hear. So all these are indications of how Ice Age actually uh, resulted in the continental drift, which even science accepts. So what we should do is we must become the bridge as universities, as education institutions, between the government and the people. It is not for the government, it is for the educational institutions to take up this mashal, this torch of wisdom and be the lighthouse, I feel, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Much obliged. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pamarty, sir. It was uh, truly uh, wonderful to listen to your uh, talk and uh, we wish and hope and pray that you keep guiding us when it comes to, you know, policy level uh, decisions or something that the higher educational institutions can uh, actually implement and uh, join hands with the government for the same. Uh, Niti ma'am, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Niti ma'am, if you could throw some light on the kind of work that Tata Institute of Social Sciences is doing in, uh, you know, uh, sensitizing communities. Uh, so, uh, uh, so Avanti uh, ma'am, uh, we, uh, sorry, Priya ma'am, we work with, uh, our work primarily involves <coughs> dealing with community and community in, in field of disasters. We've been working since, uh, the history has been to be uh, working with communities since the partition times. But uh, after that, also we worked on the super cyclone, the the Latur earthquake, Bihar, and so we worked on a lot of recovery programs as well as DRR programs. We work with uh, the municipal corporation or with a lot of state disaster management uh, authorities for training and capacity building. We do a lot of research. Like uh, I uh, recently, I did a research on uh, heat wave uh, on heat wave projects uh, for for the American Red Cross. So we have a lot of research based work, field action projects. Uh, we are working with uh, uh, one of our faculty is working in Vidarbha for some good five to six years, and we have a campus in Tuljapur. So uh, they are working on psychosocial care with uh, with farmers or in distress level, like in drought and distressed families. So these type of work we do, uh, uh, we do, uh, we keep on doing. And then there's there are various departments also in uh, in TIS which work on various things. So one of our faculty in social work is uh, is working on climate change innovation projects through. Uh, uh, through action research. So his students and he takes up a lot of, so there is research and then there is teaching, there is field action projects. So there are different ways through which we work in community and uh, sensitization programs. So yeah, uh, you can ask about any details of program and projects. Uh, I can I can go ahead with that. Thank you so much, ma'am. That's wonderful to know. Yeah. And, uh, yes, Pamati sir, there was a question from Shwet. Now, what's worse, natural disasters or man-made disasters? And uh, yes, I would say it's disaster a, of any kind. It's, it's absolutely man-made any time, any point of time, yeah. man-made. Okay. We do not use the term natural disasters anymore. The research and disaster studies say there's no there's natural hazard and there's man-made hazard, but there is no natural disasters. All disasters are man-made. Man well, but, <laughs> but 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 nomenclatures nomenclatures do not uh, do not vary the fact yeah. that earthquakes are not made earthquakes are not made by man, nor caused by uh, so. Yeah. Nomenclature doesn't matter. How we address mm -hmm. and how we tackle and how we preempt is what we should all focus. I feel. Yes. Okay, uh, so dear friends, again, the forum is open for discussion if anyone has any questions to ask. And I, on uh, uh, 
on part of avantika i have a appeal to make to everyone if you could just give your view points in the chat box on how exactly as educational institutions we can join hands with the policy makers and with nidm uh, in you know uh, addressing the issues for example community based climate change adaptation and how exactly can we contribute as a educational institution so your view points in the chat box would be highly appreciated dear friends so any ideas that you have uh, which we can uh, you know put forward to nidm and join hands with them and work on it together since uh, as i uh, told yesterday whatever has reached your neighbor if a calamity has reached there and it will take very short time for it to reach your house so i think it is a, a responsibility of us as uh, responsible citizens of india uh, so please feel free to share your view points and in the meantime i would uh, request honorable vice chancellor dr nitin rani uh, to please give the concluding remarks and share his thoughts on the three day online training program that we organized in association with national institute of disaster management over to you sir thank you dr priya thank you good afternoon everyone uh, as the vice chancellor of avantika university it is uh, truly my privilege to deliver the valedictory address uh, not because uh, avantika university has uh, hosted uh, this session uh, but because we uh, truly take pride in the fact that uh, we have taken the first step as an academic institution in creating awareness uh, related to disaster management we truly appreciate the efforts uh, taken by the national institute of disaster management nidm uh, ministry of hope affairs government of india for the opportunity provided to us since many uh, among uh, you are from education institution i appeal to you to uh, conduct Uh, similar awareness program on various facts of disaster uh, management at your institutions i also request all of you to add off minimum uh, five villages in your vicinity and create awareness there too the government is already doing their duty and it is a time that we uh, should join hands uh, with the government and uh, local administration uh, in this venture we are truly thankful to the resource persons of the sessions conducted across uh, three days for sparing their valuable time and sharing their knowledge uh, and your contribution shall go uh, long way in nation building thank you uh, all of you we look forward to having such kind of sessions in future too we are really thankful to entire team of nidm for the support extended to us thank you one and all thank you yeah. thank you rani sir uh, dear friends it is uh, uh, my pleasure to deliver the vote of thanks so yes ma'am neeti ma'am thank you so much uh, yes so neeti ma'am is uh, you know uh, ma'am if you could uh, share your views with everyone in this forum it would really be great because uh, i think you know each university or institution who has joined can if they can prepare this and if they can share it you know with nidm it would really be a great initiative yes neeti ma'am okay uh, no, uh, so as you, as you were asking if there are any suggestions which organizations can do so uh, the first would be having your own disaster management or the institute wise disaster preparedness program uh, plan where uh, we can look at you can look at the national safety program by nidm uh, it's uh, it's a flagship and old program of nidm you can it's for school but you can also adapt it for your institute and every organization which is over here can have their own disaster preparedness plan and sensitization of students is part of that plan so uh, you can start with that and 
then go on to work with uh, your local municipal organization on disaster response and recovery. So have student volunteers to work with uh, municipal corporations as, vol uh, as volunteers. And uh, there are training and capacity building funds available with the state, uh, with the state authorities. Uh, and they have something called as Apda Mitra. Abda Mitra program. You can have your students enrolled in these Abda Mitra program and be trained as volunteers for response and recovery based activities. So these are things you can, these are just small things which I can think of how we, as an institute you can go ahead. Yes. And later on you can explore about more research and uh, policy and advocacy inputs for according to your, uh, according to your city and what local inputs you can go ahead. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Mamati sir, we have one request. Uh, in case we have some, uh, you, you know, uh, plan of action or, you know, um, how to sensitize people, can we share it with you? Because you're uh, one of, uh, you know, key change makers in the society. Yes, you're on mute, sir. Uh, so your microphone is on mute. You're most welcome, all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mamati sir. Much obliged. So, dear friends, it gives me immense happiness to propose the vote of thanks uh, for the three-day online training program on community-based climate change adaptation, jointly organized by Avantika University in collaboration with National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India. We are extremely thankful to Sri Taj Hassan, IPS Executive Director, NIDM, Professor Santosh Kumar, Head GIDRR Division, NIDM, Dr. Preeti Soni from NIDM, the entire NIDM team uh, comprising of Mr. Vivek Sharma, Mr. Ali Haider, Shipra Das. We are so thankful to you, everyone, uh, for the uh, immense support you know, given to us during the uh, planning and execution of this training program. And I request everyone to join the network uh, of universities and institutions which have been constituted by National Institute of Disaster Management, not just as a, uh, you know, a statutory thing to do, but as a, a responsible citizen and a responsible academician, please join the network and join hands with NIDM in this noble venture. We are extremely thankful to our speakers uh, across all the three days. Uh, we have uh, we had Colonel Sanjay Srivastava, sir, who gave us a wonderful session. Ms. Misha Tandon, uh, who was a speaker on uh, day one. Mr. Manish Kamle and Mr. Anup Notyal. And our speakers for today, uh, Neeti Mishra, ma'am, as well as Pamarti uh, Venkatramana, sir. Extremely thankful to one and all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Priya, ma'am, and thank you to all the audience for listening uh, for listening to us. I hope we've been able to make some contribution to your knowledge base and action for the future. Thank you, thank you ma'am, and we look forward to have uh, such uh, you know uh, sessions in future too in association sure. with the Institute of Social Sciences. Sure. Look forward to having your sessions in future too, Pamarti sir. Thank you so much. Much obliged. Thank you all of you. God bless. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. And Jai stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Jai Hind.